Vampires have done pretty big business in recent times with awesome ones who like to screw, fight, and drink blood to the not-so-awesome ones who sparkle in the sun like diamonds. Ugh. One thing is certain though, whether you're a fang, banger, or not, vamps aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Like what we do in the shadows continues to be a hysterical TV adaptation of the equally hilarious movie. New Charles House films such as A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night bring a fresh, exciting take on vampire lore. Even Spider-Man's best friend, Ned, is now Reginald the Vampire. And don't get us started on Morbius. In 2008, however, Swedish film director Thomas Alfredson thrust himself onto the vampire scene with his widely praised film adaptation of John Alvide Lindqvist's 2004 vampire novel, Let the Right One In. Alfredson's wonderfully atmospheric film of the same name managed to keep the traditional vampire lore so well known across popular culture while providing a novel spin on some of its codes and conventions, as well as taking a beautiful look at preteen relationships. And and emotions. Two years later, Cloverfield director and future Batman Hilmer Matt Reeves remade the film, keeping the tone of the movie very similar to both the original film and source material and retaining the same story beats as the Swedish original. Reeves would claim that his film was more of an adaptation of the novel rather than a remake of the movie, yet it is a very faithful adaptation of both and proves that sometimes American remakes of much-loved foreign horror movies actually do work. We're looking at you, Wicker Man. Oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! So let's sink our teeth into this eerie edition of Face Off. Disclaimer, no actual science was used to determine the outcome of Face Off. Your results may vary. Please do not consume Face Off if you are allergic to conjecture, opinion, or general nonsense. Round one, story adaptation. The opening scene of Let Me In is a direct swerve away from that of its Swedish counterpart as the events transpiring are actually from the halfway point of the narrative. We see a striking image of an ambulance, sirens blaring and flanked by police cars racing through a beautiful snowy desert landscape. At this point in the story, the father, who is unnamed here unlike the original, is dying and already in the hospital as local police detective arrives to question him and discovers he has a daughter. By starting at this point of the story, Reeves brings an immediately unsettling violent tone to the film as events are already beginning to unravel and the voice of Ronald Reagan via the hospital television declaring that America is good and not an evil country is a brilliant parallel to the actual truth in the movie. In Let the Right One In, however, we witness the events of the movie and the eventual reveal that Ely is a vampire, although it is never actually revealed in the movie at roughly the same time that Oscar does. It all adds to the slow burn that Thomas Alfredson adapts from the source material, and his film is the more nuanced of the two. By the time Oscar has first met Ely at the Jungle Gym, it is also the first time we, the audience, see her face. Reeves manages to make the broader themes of his movie apparent with the non-linear approach to the narrative and perhaps the subtitles of the Swedish original and its characters' as nuances were lost on a more mainstream audience. However, for the more thematic and understated approach to the story, this round goes to Sweden. Verdict, let the right one in. Round two, characterization. One of the main strengths of Let Me In is that although the story structure and narrative beats are largely similar apart from the opening time shift, some of the characters go in different direction to that of their counterparts in the Swedish original. They also swap certain characters out and leave some key ones out of the original, but not necessarily to the detriment of its appeal. For example, in Let the Right One In, the father figure played with subtle emotion by Per Ragnar was enigmatic and in some ways empathetic. When he kills an unfortunate fella towards the beginning of the movie drains his blood then clumsily lets it spill out of his claret container when spooked by a dog you root for him to escape despite his murderous intent it's a very hitchcockian twisted moment and displays the strength of the director's work in let me in richard jenkins plays the father figure here although we're never told he's the girl's dad however and brings with it his usual gravitas pained emotion and pathos to the role let the right one in focuses a lot on the story on the local friends who meet the father at a bar and soon become embroiled in the ensuing horror to come. One of them, Virginia, played by Ike Nord, is bitten by Illy and subsequently suffers a grisly death. When her unbeknown transformation into a vampire is exposed as a nurse in the hospital opens a window, allowing the sun shining through to engulf her in flames. Ouch. 
This also happens in Let Me In, but we haven't spent much time with the unfortunate lady who suffers the same fate, so we don't feel much of a connection to her. Another big change up with the characters is the introduction of the policeman who investigates discovers he had a daughter or who he thinks is his offspring when questioning him at the hospital. In the original, another of the locals, Lake, played by Peter Kalberg, is given more screen time and his fate is mirrored by that of the policeman from the remake when he visits Ely and Haken's apartment only to be murdered by the sleeping young vampire. The characterization in both movies is handled with expert skill, but for a more human approach, this round goes to the remake. Round three, direction. The fact that Matt Reeves went on to direct one of the most haunting indelible takes on Batman ever to put on screen means that rewatching his older work gives you a clear understanding of his style of direction and dark, broody visual flourishes. Just look at the scene in which the father hides in the back of the car and you can see clear comparisons with the Batman's take on the Riddler. The opening shot of the movie with the ambulance racing to the hospital with the badly disfigured father is framed to almost evoke the original's opening scene of darkness to the left-hand side of the frame and falling snow to the right. Reeves matches this with the darkness of the environment in the direction the ambulance and police cars are heading, suggesting that danger awaits them, much like the original's more subtle opening does. Reeves enhances the white snow-filled scenes with a repeated warmth whenever Abby and Owen are together, conveying the love and connection that these characters share. In another standout sequence, Reeves positions his static camera in the back of the car as it tumbles down the hill, the viewer almost experiencing the terror as the environment spins around. It's scenes such as this that has showed much promise in Reeves before he properly burst onto the Hollywood scene. Another nice touch is how we never see Owen's mother properly with her figure and face always just out of frame, so the audience is as alienated from her as Owen is. Although Matt Reeves arguably had a larger budget than Thomas Alfredson had to work on in his adaptation, it was still not as large as most modern Hollywood remakes. This means that the stylistic choices in mise-en-scene both movies were largely down to the creative choices by both directors. What Alfredson does so well is utilize his framing to further enhance the characters and to give us clues about their trajectory throughout the movie. It's a tense, unsettling horror film that the measured editing acts to enhance this. Oscar is confined to loneliness and solitude, both by the circumstances he finds himself in and also by the camera's framing. We either see him in constricting close-ups with a blurred background or in long shots against a deserted, snowy backdrop. This isolation is cleverly portrayed, and it's not until Eli starts to share the frame with him that we see his once lonely, desperate world begin to blossom and become something he never dreamed would occur. Real friendship and genuine companionship. Overall, Let Me In just has that extra invention when it comes to the directorial choices, so this round goes to the remake. Verdict, let me in. Round four, spilling the claret. We're raising the stakes, get it? In this contest now, and this round will focus on what many came to see these movies for, spilling the blood. And both movies feature some suitably gnarly scenes that should quench the thirst of die-hard horror fans. Both movies are slow burners with excellent character and story development, so when the blood starts flowing, it's glorious, despite each featuring some subpar visual effects. The opening kills in each are largely similar with the father venturing out to find fresh blood for the girl. Let the right one in doesn't graphically show us the poor young man's throat being slit, but the sound design and subsequent blood pouring into the plastic container looks very realistic. The scene is further confounded in Dark Pathos with the comical poodle watching him desperately try to escape detection before lapping up the spilt blood. Let Me In goes a little further by showing us the knife slitting the man's throat before filling up the container with the flowing claret. The prosthetics used to show the horribly disfigured father at the hospital are also very realistic and adds a tinge of sadness to his subsequent death after having his blood drained by Abby before falling to a messy demise. Both feature some excellent scenes of carnage and it isn't until the end when we see just how powerful the imagery is as the main protagonists eventually overcome the awful bullies in each film. Matt Reeves shows some of the carnage after Owen is saved by Abby from being drowned with the bullies being dragged around the swimming pool and decapitated or dismembered one by one. 
This matches the same scene in the Swedish original, but in that version, Alfredson lingers on a wide shot of the swimming pool, showing us exactly what Ely has done to the bullies. We see two decapitated bodies, another with his torso removed from his legs, and possibly most chilling of all, one of the boys is left unharmed, quivering to the side of the pool as he looks upon the mangled body of his bully friends. Guess lunch money is now safe at that school. For this round, we gotta give it to Verdict. Let the right one in. Disagree? Let us know. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel while you're at it. You'll regret it if you don't. Round five, visual effects. We're getting down to the wire now and both boxers are on the canvas after a bruising four rounds. So which of them could dust themselves off like the Italian stallion and deliver some knockout blows? Well, this round is about to erupt like a newly turned vampire whose curtains have just been opened to allow sunlight to burn them to a crispy end as we take a look at visual effects in each film. One moment from from Let the Right One In really emphasizes this. When Oscar first meets Ely, she's standing on top of a snow-covered jungle gym with his back to her, as she nonchalantly glides down from her perch, showing the audience that she is not human, or perhaps even a girl, like she appears. It's a lovely piece of subtle filmmaking. Let Me In doesn't copy this in its corresponding scene, but what it does so well is combine a mix of practical in-camera effects plus digital trickery to create the aforementioned car crash, for example, as the car reverses away from the gas station, the real actors are inside, but a stunt driver was on top controlling the vehicle. Another plate was shot on a blue screen with a car rotating on a rotisserie, a stuntman resembling the main actor and a dummy setup. The resulting sequence is excellent, and although it's not as subtle as the effects in the original, it's great to see a bigger budget movie employing such techniques. However, there are two sequences in both that appear a tad jarring and take you out of the experience somewhat. In Reeves's remake, it's the scene where Abby has to hunt for blood alone and kills a passing man in a subway tunnel. However, the resulting CGI makes the attack look slightly silly and doesn't mesh with the rest of the movie's clever subtleties. The same can be said of the sequence in the original where a bunch of weird looking CGI cats attack the freshly vampiric Virginia. Again, it completely takes you out of the movie and seems like an unnecessarily jarring effect that arguably wasn't required. Overall, both films utilize some extraordinary visual effects but because of some odd choices when it comes to CGI, this round is a tie. Verdict, draw. Round six, performances. So it all comes down to this final round. Which of these awesome movies will live for eternity sucking the blood of all and which will forever be banished to a life of sparkling in the sunshine like an odd looking alien? Well, examine the performances of the main protagonists in each movie to thrash it out. Let Me In features two amazing actors in both Chloe Grace Moritz and Cody Smith McPhee while it's strange not to see her not dropping F-bombs. Okay, see what she can do now. And killing goons, it's refreshing to see her tackle an otherworldly presence with such aptitude and poise. She brings a delicate level of innocence, menace, and terror to her performance that is similar to her counterpart in the Swedish original. What separates the performance, however, is that Lena Leanderson's E.V. looks more like an average kid who happens to be a bloodthirsty vamp rather than the more traditional movie star appearance that Moritz has. The decision to use a different voice actor for Ely and also a different actor altogether for when she's full-on vamped out really crafts a distinctive performance overall. Both Cody Smith, McPhee, and Carrie Hiddebrandt also do great work as Owen and Oscar, respectively. It's credit to both actors who managed to make the vulnerability and also potential violence in their characters shine through. Hiddebrandt is perhaps slightly more convincing as the bullied kid who just doesn't have the ability to socialize well, while Smith McPhee demonstrates just why his star is on the constant rise thanks to turns in The Power of the Dog and Elvis recently. In the end, though, this vampire infused face off goes to the one that is the more subtle, emotional, and touching film that is in large part due to its brooding performances from key cast members. So this contest goes to Let the Right One In. Winner, Let the Right One In. There we have it, folks. Whether you're a true blood-guzzling fang banger, or even if you like your vampires all sparkly and romantic, which is no one, right? We have our victor in this face-off, and it's time to think about which movie you would have chosen as the winner. Let us know in the comments, and while you're at it, why not tell your friends who may like this sort of content about our videos? Until next time, thanks for watching.